companies, they really did good things. The tariff was a great example. Uh, the tariff was a tax on imported goods, principally from Europe, principally from England. Uh, the reason for the tariff originally was that American companies could not compete against cheap English goods, uh, better goods that were produced cheaply in England. This is like in the, the 1800s, 18 teens, right? Uh, and so the government, in order to save these businesses, uh, we want American companies to eventually develop, right? So you pass the tariff, you tax English goods. You tax them so high that they're le they cost more than American goods. And then the idea is that eventually the American goods, they get customers, that the American company, which wouldn't have any customers without the tariff, now has customers, right? Now people go buy their goods, and they can use that money to make their business compete with the British. And then at some future point, you get rid of the tariff, and we're fine, right? I mean, like, it's, it's fine. The, uh, uh, the American companies can now compete with the British companies. It's like when you're a little kid, and you get the water rings, so you go swim. You can't swim on your own, but you put the water rings on, and eventually you don't need them, and they take them off, and you're fine. Uh, and so American companies in the 1780s can't compete with the British. Uh, they had the Industrial Revolution. We didn't even have it yet. Uh, so you, you put the tariff on, you tax the British companies a lot, so their goods become unprofitable, and then the American companies use that time to, you know, to get to work. In practice, uh, the tariff lasts forever, because what it really means is that these companies, even if you get your business to compete with the British to where your goods are as cheap and as good as the British, the tariff still gives you this nice profit margin. If the British goods are taxed, say, a $30, $40 a ton, you just you raise the price of your goods, say, $27 a ton, more than it needs to be, right? Uh, and so what the tariff ends up being is a tax passed on to the American consumer. And consumers hated the tariffs. If the British produce goods cheaper than the American companies, why is that my problem? Right? Maybe you, your company should not stink out loud, right? Uh, and even once your company can compete with the British, we should get rid of the tariff, and then everything will be cheaper, right? But of course, guys like this, they don't want to lose that profit, right? And so the tariff, uh, if anything, it doesn't go down in the late 19th century, it goes up. Uh, it goes uh, it gets tightened, more goods get added to it, it uh, rates get raised, and uh, customers hated it on the Great Plains. Uh, there was a huge political revolt among populists, and they called it the People's Party, they called themselves. They hated the tariff. You're a farmer, you have a cow, you sell the cow for ten dollars. Uh, the slaughterhouse kills the cow, cuts off the cow, they use the hose for glue, they use the, uh, the skin to make leather, they sell you the meat, uh, you go back to buy a pair of shoes for your kids. The shoes are twelve dollars. How is it possible that a piece of the cow that was worth ten dollars is worth twelve dollars? Uh, the rest of well, when the rest of the cow was worth negative two dollars. It doesn't make any sense. And of course, the populace attributed all those things to the tariff. The tariff is what allowed companies to get away with charging those rates for their products because it's not like you could just buy foreign shoes. It's not like you just buy you could buy seven dollars shoes from the British shoe company. They would have to be twelve dollars because of the tariff too. Uh, and so the fight over the tariff was in some ways the, the, the political fight of the late 19th century. Uh, if you were pro-business, well, the tariff was necessary and it was good for the companies. If you, were, if you were, let's say, opposed to that kind of agenda, then the tariff was this horrible sort of weight around America's neck. And the populace, by the way, the big thing they wanted was the government to get off the gold standard. Uh, the gold standard meant the government could only uh, print money equal to the amount of gold that it had in its vaults because each, each dollar was worth a certain amount of gold, right? Uh, the companies liked that. They liked the dollar to be expensive and meant that their exports were very valuable. Uh, and so the problem is if you're a farmer and you borrow money, it means that it's, the prices are low. Dollars are valuable, so prices are low. It doesn't take many dollars to buy things. Uh, it means mortgages are expensive and difficult to get and difficult to pay. If the government was able to print money based on how much gold and silver it had it by the tally standard, the government would print more money. Money would be worth less. Prices would go up because it would cost more dollars to get the same thing. Uh, but you know, if you had a mortgage, it would be great because your mortgage wouldn't change. It would be denominated. You stole the bank $1,000, right? And now you, you would, you'd make more money when you sold things. And you'd spend more money when you bought them, but you'd be able to pay your mortgage back much easier, right? I would love that. If you added a zero to the end of my salary and didn't change my mortgage payment, all of a sudden my mortgage payment would become like 70% less of my income, right? Uh, it, would be, it would shrink as a, as a percentage of my total income, right? Uh, the problem is the companies didn't like that. Uh, and so the fight today seems totally arcane uh, to fight over the currency should have gold center. Unless you're a person who is a, a, an economic libertarian, the gold standard is a totally foreign and arcane debate. And it was a huge thing in the 19th century. Uh, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest best-selling novels in the 19th century was in fact about this. It's about this girl, and she's from Kansas, uh, and she's a big populous country, right? And she gets caught in a tornado, and she gets swept away to this crazy, bizarre fantasy <laughs> land. Uh, <laughs> where these witches and stuff. And the, the witches, by the way, the good witches are from the east and west, where the wind blows, it's good for the crops. The north and the south wind, it's hot and cold, is the, the, the bad witches. Uh, and so 
the, uh, the, uh, the she's got to get back to where she's from. She's got to, in the original uh, story, the slippers were emerald uh, because she has to go to the Emerald City, she's called Money. Uh, and she has to go to the Yellow Brick Road, right, which is the color of gold, right? Uh, and so in the land, she's in the land of Oz. Oz is the abbreviation for ounces, which is how you measure gold. And so when L. Frank Baum wrote uh, The Wizard of Oz, it was all the parable about the dangers of gold standard and how we had to, had to move to a bi-metallic economy that the flying monkeys are cheap Chinese labor and it's going to come take the job, right? Uh, so yeah, it turns out when they made it into a movie, they, they did all of the all the populism got taken away. It's just a fun story, right? Uh, and so as it turned out, though, uh, there were some legitimate questions people had about the fact that something like 80% of people in the country think the tariff is too high, but it turns out the companies like it, so it stays. Right? Uh, and, and again, that's a, that's a concern that people had. This never would have happened before because companies would have never been able to exert that much influence. Right? I mean, a small company, I mean, Standard Oil is not a small company, it's huge, but relative to the total population, it's tiny, right? And yet, a guy like Carnegie can, can call up his senator and say, yeah, I, I, steel can't, you can't take steel off the tariff, it'd ruin my business, right? So I'll give you $5 million and you make a stay, right? Uh, and so it was a great story. The Pennsylvania State Legislature was described as a wholly owned and operated subsidiary of Standard Oil, or excuse me, of U.S. Steel. And there's a scene, a reporter was in the gallery, and he watched the state legislature finish their business for the day and start packing up to go home and this session had ended. And he actually watched a lobbyist from U.S. Steel walk down to the center of the state legislature and bang the gavel to send everybody home. Uh, he's not a member of the legislature, he was a lobbyist. And he's sitting in the back of the gallery and he just walked up and said, like, we're done here, and bang it. Uh, and gavel. And so uh, the idea that these companies have an undue influence in the government, it's, uh, today this does not seem like a particularly shocking debate, right? We've, we've had debates about this sort of stuff all over the politics in the last 25 to 30 years, uh, whether corporations should be able to spend money influencing elections and uh, what constitutes the corruption and so on. Uh, but this is sort of the new thing in the 1880s and 90s, and the scale of these giant companies is really what drives this, this discussion, right? There's never been something like this before, right? So. Uh, why don't we take our 10 minute break and we come back, we'll talk about a couple other things we need to talk about, then we'll talk about how all this plays out for actual workers in the various factories that uh, we're talking about. So uh, 10 minutes and then we will discuss that. <sighs> Thank you. 